Okay, welcome everyone to the uh, virtual currency panel. Um, we have a number of distinguished guests with us. Um, Sebastiano from Dropis, uh, Matthew Slater from Community Forge, um, Jan Goslick from uh, Bitcoins in Berlin, and um, Eli Gotthill from uh, Punk Money. Um, I am Joel Dietz. I help organize uh, WeShare um, activities in Berlin, and I also am uh, the founder of a virtual currency startup. So we're going to divide the time um, here by giving a little bit of an overview, some um, issues related to visual, virtual currencies and mainstream currencies, and then some time for open questions at the end. So make sure you, um, you know, think of questions along the way, and we'll definitely give you a good amount of time for asking them. So, so I'm going to start by giving a little bit of broader historical context for sort of currencies. Um, this is, uh, if you guys want to look at this too, it's a little bit of a story of sort of currencies and how they've evolved in the last hundred years. Um, you know, for most of the 20th century, uh, gold-backed currencies were sort of the default uh, currency of the global system. And sort of after we've moved in the end of the 20th century to a sort of fiat system, um, you know, where there is no uh, commodity backing, no gold backing, um, you know, there's some fragmentary um, and different um, tendencies that have happened. And, you know, as that sort of global system related to currencies has fragmented, there's been a lot of growth around the edges um, of which, you know, some, I'm sure many of you um, have heard of the stories related to Bitcoin, which has been uh, maybe in some ways the most famous virtual currency. And for this talk, we're basically using virtual currency in a very broad way um, because there's no agreed upon definition for basically currencies that are primarily traded digitally or in some ways exclusively traded digitally um, instead of more mainstream currencies. And there's a lot of different aspects um, to these things. And in some ways, the space has exploded, um, not only because of Bitcoin and all of the variations on Bitcoin that have happened, um, but a lot of um, community currencies, which have also taken digital aspects. Um, and those aren't necessarily new things, um, but they have um, received more interest as you know certain things have um, fr fragmented and disintegrated in the global ecosystem. Um, and basically, you know, we're all here with a, a number of different sort of aspects on what we see as far as the problems with the present monetary system and the opportunities. So I thought I'd start off by giving, um, you know, people the opportunity to, to see, to comment on what I've just said and see if there's anything else that you'd like to add to that as far as the current situation. Okay. So uh, just keep my, my time in check. As far as problem uh, problem goes, <coughs> yeah. First, so you were talking about the virtual currencies. Uh, if you are at a panel about virtual currencies, I must be a virtual uh, speaker because uh, actually virtual currencies are currencies are all virtual, and even the currency that we have that we believe is real is mostly virtual. Um, how many of you uh, think that there is uh, money in your bank account the money in your bank account really exists you know how many of you believe the money you have in your bank exists you know physically none okay that's good so uh around 90 <coughs> 97 98 percent of the currency is just virtual even in uh, the real money and how many of you believe the state actually creates the currency that's a very important crowd <laughs> that's very good. Uh, the currency we use is created by private banks, private central banks, and private commercial banks. So as far as the problems go, uh, the first one is the one of privacy and publicity. Yeah, you, money is a common good, basically, so we all use it, we all accept it, but it's created by private corporations. And is it managed as if it was a public uh, good, you know, with public power, it's backed by governments. Another uh, problem is access to credit. Credit is very is vital for private uh, entrepreneurs and, and business, and access to credit is limited to those who actually have the links to the credit structure. So it's uh, this is another issue. But the biggest issue, in my in my opinion, is that one of scarcity, which brings us back to Bitcoin. Uh, money has been related to precious metals for centuries. 
and we used gold as money and now we use fiat currency as money but we still deal with it as if it was a commodity as if it was material so we for example lend it at an interest at a price and it is scarce so it is uh, managed as if it was scarce but it's in fact just information it's just it's just virtual so the biggest problem is that one of scarcity we live in a paradigm where currency is scarce and this um, influences the whole economy, the people who use it, and forces us, us to compete sometimes, even uh, when competition shouldn't, couldn't, uh, couldn't be needed. So it's a kind of forced competition because we live in a scarce by design currency system. And this is because uh, currency has always been thought of as a commodity, as a material. And this brings us uh, to Bitcoin, which, if I uh, can provoke a little bit the audience and the discussion, could be seen as uh, an involution of the current uh, economic system. Because we are coming from a system of scarcity and we are trying to go towards a world of abundance and then cooperation and sharing. And cooperation and sharing is easier when we are not forced uh, to compete, but when we are allowed by abundant resources to share, so we need an abundant uh, monetary system, an abundant currency system, which we can talk about what it means, but something that is not scarce by design. And again, Bitcoin is scarce by design, exactly like the current fiat system. I just wanted to add something about the power relationships, because uh, if we're talking about redesigning currencies for me that's just not interesting unless we can change the power relationships between the people who are currently issuing the currencies and the people who are using them who perhaps in a peer-to-peer -peer world should have some control over how they're managed so at the moment money is issued uh, for profit uh, and in unlimited quantity by private corporations and they uh, it's a tremendous power and privilege to be able to issue currency because you get to say where it goes to in the first instance. And when money is issued, it doesn't go into peer-to-peer -peer projects such as the, the type that we're all interested in here. It tends to go into projects that yield the most profit for the issuer. And so when I'm talking about virtual currencies, what I'm interested in is empowering the users of money, which is uh, most of us, uh, to control the quantity of money and where it is issued to. Um, there are some seats up here. Yeah. Well, let's come up and take them. Yeah. I'm Jan and I just founded a consultancy related to Bitcoin and I really agree to you. It's very important that you can send money from person to person without a bank. And Similar is that you always have all the adopters. All the adopters, like um, gold traders or like politicians or like central banks or private bankers, they own the most money and they have their own debt because they know how the system works. And I think it's very important that uh, you don't need a bank to send money and you don't need to pay for sending money because we have all smartphones or we are all online. And why do we need a bank for that? This is the main question what the creator of Bitcoin was so thinking about. Um, yeah, I, I sort of agree with the um, general point of view of all the other panelists. I think the monetary system is deeply dysfunctional and um, is actually the hidden cause for a lot of our economic problems. Um, the what, what I think is interesting about money is that it essentially is an illusion. Uh, the reason why you would hand over valuable goods and services for a symbol uh, is because you believe along with a lot of other people, that, that symbol has some value. Uh, in other words, it depends entirely on belief. Um, but our situation is a bit like we're only allowed to have a certain type of illusion, the one that's created by private banks. Um, so what I'm interested in is essentially democratizing that illusion of money, uh, finding ways of making money more open and democratic, and in doing so, solving the systemic problems that the money system creates. I'd like to add something. Um, I think money is really nothing. Money is based on trust and money is based on 
fulfill your demands. You don't care about your money. You don't. You care about your demands. You care about what do you want. And if you have it, the money you, know, you don't need it anymore. You have to trust in the merchant. And if the trust is over there, then you can do exchange or you can try to offer something. Okay, does anyone else have anything else to say about the problems in the monetary system today? Yeah. Uh, maybe a local one about Italy. I'm coming from Italy. And in Italy, as in other European countries like Greece and Spain, we're uh, having a deep economic crisis. And this is, again, another paradox of this system. We have all the resources, all the capabilities, all the potential. We have all the needs for consumption. But suddenly, sometimes, the money disappears and have a crisis. And people connect crisis with wealth and poverty. So people who don't earn an income anymore, they feel and label themselves as poor just because they don't have a monetary income anymore. But our point, at least my point, is that uh, wealth is defined not by how much money or uh, which kind of money you earn, but the potential of helping other people. If you can help and add value, then we can use other symbols, other currencies. Yeah, I, I think it's just important to point out like a couple of features of the money system. So um, one is that the total amount of debt that exists today exceeds the total amount of money. So it's actually impossible um, to pay down all of the existing debt in the world. Um, and I'll give a very concrete example of day-to-day um, -day problems that the money system creates in London. Uh, London has one of the most overinflated property markets in the world. Um, and a major reason why property is so inflated uh, is because of bank-created credit that goes straight into the housing market. Um, that credit bids up the price of houses. So essentially it's just a, a big bubble. Um, and the people who pay uh, for this are the poorest people who have to pay rent. Uh, so it's a drain on the wealth of the poorest people. Uh, it's like a funnel of wealth that goes straight up to the banking system. Um, so that's just one concrete example of what's wrong with it. Okay. Um, I would like to go into a little bit of discussion now about sort of opportunities for disruption. Um, within the current system, because I think you know we've all talked about this a little bit, and I'm sure we've seen different things happening on the fringes, and sometimes moving closer to the mainstream. And you know, what does the future look like? Uh, what could possibly make a very large impact um, going forward? And this is an opportunity to um, introduce our work as yeah, well. Yeah. Absolutely. So, good one. Uh, the opportunities for disruption. The biggest opportunity for disruption I see is uh, connected to the scarcity and abundance again. So uh, imagine we are living in a world, imagine living in a world where the amount of words you can say are limited and scarce. And they're never enough for you to express what you want to say and for someone else to listen. This is the world we live in in regards to money. So the disruption I see is in systems that allow people to express and share all the untapped potential that is not tapped because of the scarcity of the, of the currency. And this relates to access to credit. So wherever you, you have a, an entrepreneur with skill, even a micro entrepreneur, a sharing, a sharing economy entrepreneur um, with potential to express, that should be allowed to be expressed and the credit shouldn't be scarce by design, uh, as we were talking about. What we are doing, what we are doing uh, relating to this, is something called Dropis. There is a currency. It's actually a barter credit that is operating right now in Italy, and it works in this way. You cannot buy Dropis. You cannot sell Dropis. It's not there for speculation. It's there to allow people <coughs> to uh, share more easily to share their goods or their time. So basically making barter easy and fast because you don't need to exchange with the same person. You can buy, you can spend uh, with someone, you can buy from someone else and it's so-called uh, triangular barter, asynchronous barter. So these are the platforms that are implementing uh, our um, currency. We work with APIs similar to PayPal. So any website can implement this currency and, and use it and allow their users to buy and sell using Dropis. 
we just released the ability for people to pay via email, like PayPal, so you can uh, use the email of a person, you can send them droppers, or you can receive droppers to uh, any email account. And these are, uh, for an example of people who accept droppers as a payment, this is a like, TaskRabbit website in Italy, and these people do different sorts of tasks and, and jobs and skills, and they all accept droppers as a, as a payment. The work I'm doing in Community Forge is providing free websites to the communities, particularly of the Let's. Uh, in French, that's the Système Échange Local, the CEL. And for me, that's a very, very uh, important and strategic angle to pursue because the Let's communities are getting together and they're sharing resources. And all the resources they share are exchanged without the national currency. And so the disruptive potential that I see is that communities acting together agree not to clear their transactions with national commercial interest-bearing debt money, but with simple accounting instruments of their own making. And this encourages um, the formation of communities, because when you're a member of the community, you have, through the currency, access to all the goods and services in the community, but you're also creating a demand for those goods and services to be produced in the community. And so uh, I see the, the new currency agenda as very, very close to the relocalization agenda. And we need to be working together as local communities to meet our local needs and to use local currencies to do that. And this is in direct opposition to the globalization movement where all goods and services and money are produced globally and around. And so you need the global money to buy the global goods. And if we produce the goods locally, we can use local money and therefore uh, not rely on these uh, scarce bank currencies. Um, yeah, I'm going to let Eli go first. Um, yeah, this is my project, Punk Money. <laughs> um, more than just a name. Um, so as I said before, what I'm interested in is making money more open and democratic. Um, and I think the money should be a lot like language. Um, you don't have to ask uh, permission of um, anybody to use words or to assemble words in particular ways. These are just shared agreements that everybody uses. I think money should be like that, basically. Um, Instead of having to rely on a bank to issue it for you, you should be able to create your own money, and so should anybody else. Um, so that might sound very utopian, um, but in fact, uh, this is how money has worked in several different places and times, and most people don't know about it. <laughs> um, so nowadays, we'd call this peer-to-peer -peer money. Um, in the Middle Ages, uh, they had bills of exchange, um, credit notes, Merchants would write promises to each other, denominated in um, uh, Roman money or um, in gold or silver, and then they would exchange with these promises, and then at the end of a merchant fair, they would net out the differences left and just pay the balance. So anyway, how would this work in the uh, modern connected age? Um, well, our technology now is supposed to be even more amazing than what existed in the Middle Ages, so we should be able to do something better. Um, so punk money is a prototype to demonstrate these ideas. It's, um, I call it an open currency because, as I said, anyone can create, transfer, and redeem it, and it all takes place on Twitter. So Twitter is a ubiquitous communication medium. You don't need to ask permission to use it, just sign up. And if you know the rules of punk money, you're ready to create punk money. Um, and that's how you do it. You create a promise to somebody. So Sally is promising something to Bob, a beer. And then there's a hashtag punk money, and that identifies it as a punk money statement. Um, that's what I just said, but um, with colors. Um, and obviously, it gets a timestamp and an ID, because Twitter automatically does that for you. Um, and there are some rules to do other stuff. So you can add an expiry. Um, expires in one week. And you can say it's non-transferable, or, tr or, or not put that in if it's transferable. So that's what makes this punk money, not just a tweet, but punk money. Um, so let's imagine that Sally and Bob have a beer, 
Um, and Bob has enjoyed the beer, so he now redeems Sally's promise. This is how he shows that he's drunk the beer, and Sally's kept her promise. So he replies with redeemed and the hashtag, uh, and that's also a public statement. So we know that um, um, Sally kept her promise. Um, if Bob didn't have time to have a beer with Sally, he could transfer it to somebody else, uh, Alice. So this is what makes it money. It can act as a medium of exchange, right? So I can reply to the original tweet with transfer, the name of the recipient, Alice, the hashtag, and now Alice holds this promise for a beer. So it's a reputation-based system, and that's what it, how I think money is evolving. Um, it will be money that anybody can create, but nobody's forced to accept. Uh, at the moment, we have money that everybody is forced to accept and that hardly anybody can create. So this completely turns the tables. Um, and the protocols that define money are very simple and they're open and anyone can use them. You don't need to ask permission. Um, but on Twitter, it's a, bit of a it's a bit chaotic keeping track of promises, transfers, and redemptions. So I've built this tracker at punkmoney.org and it essentially just logs all the activity uh, on that hashtag, all the promises, transfers, and redemptions. Um, so you can see um, value being transferred through this peer-to-peer -peer money system right now. Um, that's Here's an example. Uh, promise to cook dinner from March was redeemed. Um, and there's also a printer on the website, so you can just fill it in and create punk money really quickly like that. Um, very quickly, as I said, it's fully decentralized. There's no unit of account. You can create your own. You can denominate your promises however you want, or you, or you can just not denominate them. Um, the security is crap. Um, <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you're aware of Twitter accounts being hacked. Um, so I'd say it's casual money, like it's for use with friends and acquaintances. Uh, and that's punk money. Thank you. Three months ago, I founded my own consultancy with my two best friends in Berlin. And it, we focus on Bitcoins as the future of money. We really believe in that. Before I'm going to talk more about this stuff, I want to know something from you. Whoever heard about Bitcoins? Okay. Whoever heard about Bitcoins three months ago? Um, okay, that's tough. Um, who has Bitcoins? Okay. Uh, whoever used Bitcoins to buy something? <laughs> and whoever convinced somebody else to buy Bitcoins? <laughs> okay, that's quite tough. But you can see the influence of the media. It's quite changing in the last months, and it's really a hot topic. And it's a niche, and the niche is it's an electronic version of um, cash, actually. You don't have a chargeback. If you use PayPal, if you use Visa, MasterCard for your e-commerce shopping, they have sh chargeback. You can ha call them and, no, I don't. I want to restore the money. It's not that what I want to. And PayPal, Visa, Master, they're all the kings of the chargeback, and that's why merchants have to pay a transaction fee for every transaction, 2, 3, 4, or till 5%. With Bitcoins, you have to pay zero till maximum 1% if you do it professional or if you want to have your Bitcoins in euro instead of that. Yeah. A any question, Bert? It's a moment? No. Okay. okay, it's very easy to send Bitcoins. You just need the amount. You need the address. It's like an email address, but uh, it looks like numbers and letters, and it's 20 or 25 digits big. And you copy and paste it, and you're going to send in 10 minutes. It's all over the world. It's worldwide. And you, if you want to pay a fee, uh, then it's much faster. It needs some seconds even. And it's a peer-to-peer -peer network. So the trust is in the peer-to-peer -peer network. And when I'm going to send an email attached with money, like bitcoins, uh, all the servers next to me, all the nodes next to me, all the servers have to confirm this transaction. So this is a bitcoin transaction. And after seven tr uh, confirmation, it is confirmed. It's true, and it's not possible to yeah to to hack this kind of system. When you ever heard about hacks, 
it's not easy. You need you need a fifty uh, you need a, need a fifty one percent um, um, peer to peer network uh, compared to the Bitcoin networks. But the Bitcoin network uh, one hundred thousand I don't know it's uh, anonymous one hundred thousand servers. So you need uh, fifty thousand servers to crack the system, and then you have to know how to do that, and you have to puzzle a lot of people. So when you ever heard about a hack in the Bitcoin system, it's a hack of an online wallet, for example. It's a hack of an account or a passport or something, something like that. So I really believe it's a distributed technology. So here you can see the world and how they're gonna search in Google Trends uh, about Bitcoins. Uh, all the regions uh, they're gonna uh, using bitcoins and looking for bitcoins. Uh, high educated um, countries. They are all big cities. They are all can very good speak English, not like me. And they all have good IT. It's Scandinavia, it's Baltic countries, it's America, it's Russia, and it's Australia and South Africa. And it's really nice. This is the first currency I've ever seen. In Russia and America are gonna accept this on the same level. It's not the case with yen or dollar or what else, or ruble. And here you can see a trend analysis, this one. Compare Bitcoins to Euro or US dollar with the aberration for the Forex exchange. Here was the first crisis. And over there, there's a race. You can see some cities where they're going to use a lot and where the micro systems, where the micro uh, Bitcoin system is going to grow very fast. OK, I believe that's going to change the paradigm of the banks, because you don't need a bank anymore. Who knows this guy? It's actually El Goa. And he said on Twitter, I'm a big fan of Bitcoins. It was one month ago um, at the Harvard Congress, uh, Innovation and Payment. And there are some other citations from El Goa, too. And that's what I'm doing at the moment. We gonna uh, make it possible that you can buy with bitcoins. We make it possible that merchants gonna accept bitcoins. So you really have a new use. You don't. It's not a speculation if anymore. If I, if I show you my iPad bought with bitcoins, you can't say anymore that it's a speculation. And uh, this is possible now. It's possible uh, in New Zealand and it's possible in Germany and in European too. Okay, thanks, Jan. Um, I'll start off with a question that um, you know we've we've talked about problems in the present monetary system, and everyone has commented on that. Um, quite obviously, and, and I could list some of these myself, um, you know, there's some problems with these alternative uh, monetary systems like Bitcoin. And um, I thought I'd start off actually by asking Jan, since you were the one to present on it, what the largest problems are within the Bitcoin world as you see them personally. And then we'll give other people a chance to comment on that same thing. The largest challenge is to explain to people how it works <laughs> at the moment. It's, uh, we don't believe anymore in commodities. We don't believe anymore in paper-baked uh, debt money. We believe in technology, and technology is quite more complicated. To understand how Bitcoin really works, you may need a graduation in Harvard. That's the actual problem. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I um, think Bitcoin is quite amazing, um, te technically. Because it solves, it's the first time that a system has been created for maintaining a global ledger of transactions and issuing a new currency and securing um, that system without a central issuing authority. So it's the first properly distributed value transfer system in the history of mankind. However, um, <laughs> I, I am not fully on board with Bitcoin um, for a number of reasons. Um, I don't think it's actually a very fair or open currency system. Um, it favors people with access to um, computing power and early adopters. So those are the new um, capitalists or lords uh, in the Bitcoin world. And I also think that the um, inherent scarcity of Bitcoin is problematic. That it's, um, uh, I, do th I do think that deflation is actually can be a serious economic problem. And Bitcoin is designed explicitly to bring about deflation. So um, I'm not totally sold on it, but I do think the technology is amazing. That's right. There is deflation and all the adopter wins in this system, but it's the same system with every economic system. So, and the deflation is built in, so the, all the adopters can profit for that, because otherwise it doesn't exist. You have to convince all the people, and you only can, are able to convince the people if you are a profit yourself. 
we'll move over to the system. Bitcoin shows us that it's possible to have a free market in currencies because uh, all the legal tender currencies don't compete against each other and they're all really identical. But with Bitcoin now, we have a choice to use Bitcoin or a choice to use the legal tender currencies. I think that's a very, very good thing. Uh, I also have my doubts about Bitcoin uh, as a progressive currency. Uh, it's suffered from very wild fluctuations in price, at least in its early days. We can hope that it will settle down and become a reliable monetary instrument. But until people start using it more for exchange than for holding on to it to see if it's really going to take off and really become valuable, then it's not very useful as a medium of exchange and it's not very useful as a, a store of value because uh, it could yet go down to zero. And there's nothing in Bitcoin that supports the localization agenda. It's, it's excellent for sending money across the world in seconds or at least minutes with very low friction, but that's the globalization agenda. And so I think we need uh, more alternatives to Bitcoin, but I very much hope that it will succeed. I, I agree with, with Eli that the technical <coughs> innovation is great. So it's great that we have a system that is peer-to-peer. -peer. And I do agree that it's great for transactions. It's actually great for anonymous, pseudonymous transactions. So if you want to buy drugs online, I would advise to use Bitcoin. If you want to buy guns online, if you want to pay killers. Uh, but, Child sorry? Child pornography, of course. Uh, <laughs> If you're a Nazi and you want to subscribe to the Nazi child pornography website, <laughs> but um, and actually, I, and actually, it it solves a problem. So uh, I do believe it's gonna stay for a while for these kind of markets uh, after this huge speculation and whatever is, is happening right now. The problem I see, the big issue I see with Bitcoin, is that gold has always had and has an intrinsic value. So gold is useful to dentists, to luxury, to electronics. So it's useful to do something with it. And that's what kind of covers, that's what kind of covers its value. So whatever happens, if you have gold, you know that it will have value in the future, some value in the future. It will be needed by other people in the future. On the other hand, fiat currency, the currency issued by governments, has no intrinsic value because it's just paper or numbers often, but it's it's backed by your government. So it's accepted. You need to use it for paying taxes. You need to use it. You need to accept it if someone pays you with, with that currency. Bitcoin, as Nobel Prize Krugman wrote a few days ago, is somehow a fiat currency uh, on steroids. It's the ultimate fiat currency because it's not backed by anything, not even an authority that backs it. So not, I, I don't necessarily support fiat currency, but I'm saying that it is, it is dangerous because the value of Bitcoin could drop to zero at any given time if something happens, you know, the network gets hacked or something better comes along or the community goes crazy and changes the code. So it is uh, volatile, it is dangerous, it's a big, big uh, thing, it's, it's fun to watch, it's exciting, but it's, uh, it's dangerous. For example, what we're doing, we're taking a different approach and we are uh, having a 100% backed uh, currency that is always backed by goods or services. So instead of uh, mine creating, uh, when, when a new uh, platform, a new community uh, joins our kind of federation, Dropis Federation, we issue more currency to, uh, to represent the goods and services they bring into the network. So that is uh, approaching. So let me ask um, uh, a follow-up question. Um, you know, some of these problems that we see in the Bitcoin world uh, are problems that you would also say, some of you would also say are problems of the present monetary system. Um, and one of them is this sort of fiat notion and one of the problems with fiat currencies um, as has been noted by many, many people, is this uh, quantitative easing problem. And that is basically that you, whenever you have a problem, you print more money. Um, and governments have done this many times in history, not just recently. And 
However, you know, there's a certain Bitcoin solution, and I don't know if this was completely explained, but the Bitcoin solution is that there's only a certain number of current uh, credits that are issued, and that those credits go to people who spend a lot of their processing power of their computer to get it, and that the people, and that is made easier early on. So there's only a set number that are available, and that's set by an algorithm. Um, and anyone who's not doing that has a problem. And that is saying, even for you know your solution, it says, what's going to prevent you from saying, this community that we really like, um, it, how we should issue a certain number of credits to cover this, and then we decide that. And then you have exactly the same problem as there in the present monetary system, um, et cetera. So how do you approach that? And same thing for I, everyone else, I, the same problem. Uh, it's a good question. My ultimate answer, I can answer in detail in the contact, but my ultimate answer is don't trust any currency. Don't trust even me, don't trust Bitcoin, don't trust your fiat currency for sure. Don't trust gold even, because, you know, uh, actually trust trust, which is basically the ultimate currency. And other than trust, you know, don't uh, put belief and faith in, in any currency so that currencies can compete with each other. And trust being the playground, you know, we could heart the trust in, in drops by a quantitative easy, doing easing and inflating it, but it destroys the very foundation of what we are doing, which is something that people can trust more than, or you know, to, uh, together with with uh, the currencies they are using. This is my main answer. So you can trust the gold or the paper or the government or things like that, but uh, ultimately, you, trusting the money is a proxy for trusting the other people in the network who are producing the things that you need. <laughs> we have, uh, uh, in Community Forge, we prefer a monetary model called mutual credit. And in mutual credit, you don't issue units of currency out of nothing, like a fiat. And neither do you issue units of currency based on what you have in the warehouse. But instead, you issue the credit and debt together. When one person does something for another person, one person is in obligation and one person is in credit. And that means you always have exactly the right amount of money to balance everything out in the end, because the person in credit is trying to spend that credit to get back to zero, and the person in debt is trying to earn the credit to get back to zero. So that's one of the very pleasing things about the mutual credit model, you never have to worry about how much is in circulation. And so the, the power of issuing is in the hands of the users. 